In this segment, we're going to dig a little more deeply into how these GAM models uh, can be evaluated. So we're still looking at this data on sources of bioluminescence uh, as a function of depth from one station in the North Atlantic. And what we're going to do is a, a fit a um, GAM model using library MGCV and you can see that it's actually quite easy to do in, in R to fit these models. You use the GAM function, G-A-M, instead of the generalized linear function, and you have a formula that looks exactly the same as we've done before, except that now, instead of just saying tilde depth 16, which would give us a linear model, we have this function S of depth 16. S stands for smooth function. There's a lot of options for this smoothing function, but we're just going to use the defaults for the moment. If we take that, the result of that object, the fitted generalized additive model, and say plot it and ask for the standard error, this is the plot that we get. We have a smooth curve here that shows us the shape of our uh, smooth fit as a function of the covariate along, along the bottom. The little rugs there along the bottom indicate where the observations are located along the x-axis. One of the things that to note here, though, is that the this smooth function, okay, is not on the same scale as the response. You can see that the, none of our observations were less than zero, and yet the smooth predictor is dropping down to um, about negative 10 here at the bottom. The reason for that can be seen by looking at the formula for the additive model. We've got our y hat, our fitted values, are going to be a function of an intercept, which we'll just call alpha or beta naught, plus some function of our covariates x. And so instead of having a single coefficient times x, we've got some function of x. And when you ask for the plot, what you're getting is a plot of that function. So it does not include the intercept, only the function. And so in order to get our back our actual fitted values, what we have to do is take this smooth curve and then add the intercept to it, which is going to shift this curve up or down. And so if we ask for the predicted values using function predict and some new data uh, on the response scale, then we're going to get the, that particular sum. So that base, this is basically this, the sum of the intercept plus our smooth function. And you can see that it works its way through the middle of the data quite well. If we ask for a summary of our model object, we end up with something that looks pretty familiar, except it's got one a couple of new wrinkles. Um, it's going to tell us a family and link function. This is, in this case, because we didn't specify one, it's assumed that the error is normally distributed with constant variance, and our link function is the identity function. It gives us the formula we used, and then it's going to give us a list of what it's describing now as parametric coefficients. These are going to be the coefficients that were estimated other than the smooth terms. And so in this case, there's only one, the intercept, and it's going to ha look exactly as we have seen before. We're going to have our estimate, the standard error of that estimate, the ratio of those two, which is our walled statistic, and the probability uh, of that walled statistic. The new component here is this table below that, which is described as the approximate significance of smooth terms. And there's going to be one of row in this table for every smooth term that we've included in the model. First, it's going to describe the expected degrees of freedom and the reference degrees of freedom. These are typically quite close to each other. This is um, an estimate of roughly how many degrees of freedom have been consumed by the particular smooth term that has been fitted. Then there's going to be an F statistic, which is uh, essentially the rate, the um, testing the model without the smooth term against the model with the smooth term. So it's a kind of walled statistic and the p-value here. The reason it's approximate is that um, our estimate of the variance or of the coefficient of the variance here um, is assuming that this can be done as an F statistic, but it's not necessarily um, tr a good approximation 
of, of the F statistic because the degrees of freedom are only estimated. Um, and typically the p-values here are often um, extremely small. So if, if there's any degree of nonlinearity uh, non or even if there isn't, this model will typically indicate that there's a very uh, strong effect of whatever it is that you're looking at. And then down at the bottom it gives us some approximate r squareds per proportion of the deviance explained, which is going to be the, the, um, the change, essentially the change in the, between the null deviance of our model and the residual deviance. Another new piece, however, is going to be this GCV score, uh, which again is really only um, relevant as a relative indicator uh, between, say, two different generalized additive model fits to the same data. This is the indicator that's been used to decide how uh, how smooth the uh, smooth fit should be. The estimated scale, uh, this is for the GAM model, it um, is the residual sum of squares and our sample size. So those two those two components are all um, as we've expected to see them. So part of the reason for the approximate significance is that the, the model itself has used generalized cross-validation to pick the degree of wiggliness here in this in this um, smooth term. We can evaluate this model in the way that we've done before by plotting residuals against the fitted values um, or residuals against any other covariate including the one that we've seen before. There's a little hint of heteroscedasticity here. It's much more obvious in the plot against depth where uh, at higher, uh, at shallower depths we have a much larger degree of um, variation than we do down deeper. Uh, histogram of the residuals, which doesn't look too bad, there's some extreme residual values uh, as we've seen up here. And the normal QQ plot also s gives us an indication of some heteroscedasticity with some sharp departures out beyond the edge. It's not doing too badly though here in the, in the middle. So it is looking fairly normal, but there's a, a strong hint that there's a certain amount of heteroscedasticity in the in the res, in the residual. So our constant variance assumption has clearly been violated. Now we could either not worry about that and and proceed, um, but if we wanted to try and figure out how to get how to model the variance more accurately, one option we have is using. Um, quasi likelihood instead of um, a, a true likelihood model. Uh, family equals quasi gives us a bunch of options for changing how the variance is modeled in these generalized additive models and also in generalized linear models. Um, in our case it looks like a variance proportional to the mean is what we're after and so we're going to specify family equals quasi variance, which is an argument to the quasi-function, equals mu in, qu in quotation marks. That's going to give us a variance. It's going to estimate the variance as proportional to the mean or mu of our function. The default for the quasi-function is variance equals constant, which is exactly the assumption that we, w we have if we use a Gaussian um, distribution. And we've got a, a whole bunch of options in this case though, with the quasi family. We've kind of got the mu option, which we'll use here, one minus mu times mu, which would give us a binomial like uh, option. Mu squared and mu cubed are all possible ways to model the variance as a function of the mean. Um, as I mentioned, it works with both GLM and GAM, uh, but there are drawbacks, and in particular, once you've switched over to quasi-likelihood, you can't really use likelihood-based model selection. AIC type model selection works. Uh, people often use, uh, get the uh, log likelihood out of a quasi-model um, and, and then do an AIC type model selection process and put a Q in front of the AIC statistic, call it quasi-AIC. But there hasn't really been a lot of work on determining the extent to which um, that's a valid uh, approach. So if we do that and then we fit our model, plot our residuals now against depth and we can see that they look much much better. There's none of this sort of sharp departures. The QQ plot looks much much better. Um, our plotting our residuals against the fitted values looks much better. 
and it has in fact changed the shape of our function um, quite a bit. In particular, this sort of kink uh, just between about at about 1500 meters between a thousand the samples at a thousand and 1500 meters has has decreased in magnitude because it's allowed for there to be more variability uh, at these higher um, depths shallower depths <clears throat>